Good evening and welcome to another episode of Hot Topics. As we introduced last week, today we're going to be continuing with the Rainbow Nation series. I can imagine for you sitting at home, you're thinking that this is a conversation that has been exhausted, but I've heard someone say something really profound around conversations like this, and they said, conversations that have to do with race and transformation is like drinking salt water in order to quench your thirst. The more you drink, the more thirsty you become. And that's because we realize new issues on a daily basis. And for those who are sitting at home thinking to themselves, why are we having this conversation again? I thought we were done. You know, um, I thought we were already there. We've arrived at the Rainbow Nation. I've also heard another wise person say, arriving at a rainbow requires that we go through a storm. And so it is necessary that we continue with conversations that we may at times be uncomfortable with. And so joining us for today's conversation, we've got Sigelela, we've got Lerato, and we've got Craig, who will be joining myself and Els as we continue to unpack this conversation around, is the Rainbow Nation a true concept or is it a fallacy? If I could just invite you guys to introduce yourself, let us know where you come from and from what perspective you're going to be speaking. Um, and yeah, feel free and welcome. Good evening, everyone at home and here on the stage. My name is Sigele Landlazi. I come from a legal and academic background. Um, I'm a lecturer at the University of South Africa. I'm also a social political blogger and I'm happy to be here. Thank you for the invite. Good evening, uh, everyone. My name is Larato uh, Kobe. I am, while well, also uh, coming from the University of South Africa, I'm a lecturer in missiology. Uh, so I have a theology background, and also I, I guess I'm an activist. <laughs> That's the right word to call myself. You don't know these days what to call yourself. But <laughs> yes. So I also like, um, like my whole research, for example, engages uh, on this kind of topic because I'm doing a PhD on Desmond Tutu's notion of forgiveness. And over to you, Craig, if you'd love to introduce yourself, please. Thanks, Clawney, and uh, thank you so much for having me. Yes, my name is, uh, is Craig Bailey. I'm originally from, uh, from South Africa's Eastern Cape. That's where I grew up. I've been based on South Africa's West Coast for the last uh, almost 10 years. And um, for the same period, I've been lecturing, teaching political science. I approach uh, today's topic, I think, primarily from the perspective of a Christian. You might ask, well, what exactly does that mean? But I think that's my, my pr primary approach. And I think and also as someone who is deeply passionate about Africa and its people, and uh, also about nation building. Thank you so much, Craig. It's really great to have all of you here and joining us, and I really look forward to the conversation. I know it's going to be great with all the perspectives that are involved from each of you. I really look forward to it. Um, just to those that are at home, I know you might be feeling very tempted at this point to say, why are we having this conversation? Can we not just have the get over it attitude? You know, these are things of the past. As someone who was born quite a bit after 94, this is definitely the approach of many people my age. We think, why do we want to repeat this? Why do we have to hash over this old conversation again? But to say get over it is to ignore the um, social engineering of the past, to ignore the pains of people, the stories, and all the struggles of those that have come before us. And so even though it's uncomfortable, it might be an uncomfortable series for you, I really want to encourage you to stick with us and see what you can learn and how your heart can shift or what you can bring to the conversation as well. Absolutely. That is such a brilliant point Else is mentioning. And so we're going to go straight into it. So there are mixed feelings around the idea of a rainbow nation. You know, when you chat to people, particularly in churches, um, there is one side that would say, it's a no-brainer. When we start a new democracy, we are meant to forgive, which I can imagine is going to be an interesting. I'd love to hear Lerato's heart around that. We are meant to forgive and forget, you know, or maybe not forget, but just forgive and start anew. And others would say, it's an opportunity to rebuild that has been wasted by those who loot resources through state capture, etc. And yet, on the other hand, you would have people that say there was forgiveness without justice. There was forgiveness, and yet there was no justice. How do you forgive people for a privilege that continues to go on unconfessed? And then others would even go on to say, how do you forgive people when they have not repented from the idea 
of supremacy. And so it sounds as though there is forgiveness without justice. What is your heart around the idea of the rainbow nation in light of these things that I've just mentioned? Okay, um, I see everyone looks at me, so maybe <laughs> let me start. Um, well, uh, this is the topic that I am uh, doing my research on currently, and um, and it's a it's a it's a very complex uh, uh, phenomena uh, uh, forgiveness. Um, firstly, just in general speaking, in lay terms, uh, we'll say if forgiveness was such an easy thing, then why did Jesus then stay in heaven and say, I forgive all these human beings for what they've done? So all the struggle of incarnation and coming to this earth and living here shows you that forgiveness is just not something that is just so easy. It's a very complex uh, 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 idea. And um, Secondly, looking at this uh, coming from a black theology uh, 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 perspective, um, I, I, I would say as an African, but also as a, as, a, as a black theologian, even at home, you know, we have quarrels in our home, but you never uh, 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 forgive, you never say to people, I just forgive you, and, that, and, that, and, the, and then that's it. Because then if, if this kind of thing is not talked about and is not articulated where remorse, justice needs to be taken place, this kind of attitude will continue. Yeah. And, 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 and I think this is one thing, as you were talking, I thought about a rainbow. So other people will argue a rainbow never uh, meets, you know. And other people will say, you'll never arrive at a rainbow. It's always, when you think you're close, it's always at a distance. But also, if you look at the rainbow, those colors that are, are separated, that are, 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 are like that. But I thought of it as, as, as you were speaking. What if, yes, maybe this rainbow kind of thing that Desmond Tutu gave us, but also, the fact that those colors also are like that are there to remind us of our past, that our past is with us, so that you never forget. Because also when you just expect the rainbows to meet uh, without proper uh, 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 ways of arriving at those meetings, you have a problem. Like, And I think this is what we've done in South Africa. We just sort of expected the rainbow will just dilute together. And uh, uh, so we never dealt uh, with these things that make this a rainbow. Actually, Lerato, you know, uh, just before we go to Sigalela, it's, so I, what then would you say about Charles Nguane in his thesis on politics of identity would then go on to suggest that how we write race, how we describe race as people who are looking for a new future, yes. we should describe and write it as though a concept under erasure. You know that we must. What is your heart around that? You know because I, I I feel that you are leaning more towards the idea of saying we need to embrace race, the realities of race, and even in our conversation on justice, embrace this reality and never, or rather, not maybe not prematurely start speaking about the idea of a non-racial South Africa because that will erase people's stories. Yes, yes. So I I think I I will lean more towards on that uh, as I was reading on because I'm looking at forgiveness from the perspective of Ubuntu sure. and if we talk about Ubuntu which in South Africa has made to fit in the story of Christian forgiveness which is not a, a, a for, Ubuntu doesn't mean f a forgiveness Ubuntu is a very big worldview it's a it's a it's, it's a philosophy it's a, uh, it's it's everything that it means to be a bantu, you you know, and then I was always reading Gladla yesterday. I was like, I'm sure you saw me. I posted this. I was reading Gladla, and he argues that uh, first of all, uh, 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 for for us to be able to embody Ubuntu, we will have to deal with the past. Until we are able, black people are able to have their cattle, their land, their livelihood, 
and to be able to look at their world in their own perspective, then uh, this rainbowism or forgiveness really doesn't uh, 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 speak to, 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 to black people. And, and, it's, and, and when you look at this, and I was, I, I was reading it and I was like, actually coming to think of the frontier was at the first encounter with Jan van Riebig, um, it was not Christianity, for example, or Western philosophy, Deka, I think therefore I am, that told the first African that this, what was coming was not of human, it was of oppression, and which led them to fight those frontier wars. But it was Ubuntu, because Ubuntu becomes restless when there is no justice. Sure, thank you. Your heart on the conversation around the Listen, uh, the, 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 the approach to this conversation for me is as busy and complex, as hectic as all the roads of Johannesburg. Because if you enter it from this one you know, avenue, it opens up 10 more. But then if you enter it from, from this one, you neglect all the other important conversations that actually need to feature as, as uh, an imperative element of this conversation. The, the idea of transformation and a rainbow nation for me, in my experience and my research and reading, is that it was prematurely um, placed on South Africans, black and white, and Indian, colored, all of us as a nation. We can understand the, the, the concept of a rainbow nation practically and philosophically. Practically, we, as we are here on the stage right now, are a rainbow nation. You have a black man, a white woman, a black man, a black woman. So we embody what classically would appear as a rainbow nation. However, the underlyings and the, the, the overarching elements and the overarching um, um, imperatives that also come into, um, into this conversation are those that, in my opinion, have not been given enough attention in the construct of a rainbow nation. Because remember, South Africa in 1994, when we um, um, transformed from apartheid to um, a democratic era, it was almost shoved down our throats. I mean, I was born on the 16th of October 1994, sure, I wasn't there. However, we read, we experienced, we have people in our families, we have people who have, you know, informed us of their experiences, so we can deduce one and two together, you understand? So it would be very difficult to, to acknowledge and to honor the idea of a rainbow nation as Kumbaya, we've achieved it as. Desmond Tutu, I love him, but espouses. It's not a reality. It's not a reality because even taking into account mining law, because I'm doing my research right now in mining law, there are so many, uh, there's so much understanding of what large scale mining is. And when you think of mining, you think of your Anglo Americans uh, and your De Beers and all of that, and you you would imagine or you would be forgiven to imagine the mining sector in South Africa and even internationally as being just that. The mining sector in South Africa, Zimbabwe, Lesotho, the majority of the continent, is also a hybrid of large-scale mining as well as artisanal and small-scale mining. And a large majority, a large segment of miners in the informal artisanal category um, operate in that sphere without statutorily approved mining rights, mining permits and all of that. And you may ask, but then why not just go to your local department of the DMRE and just apply for a mining right because it's costly? You have to prove that you actually have the financial and the technical strong arm um, and muscle to actually optimally mine whatever minerals you are mining um, um, in a way that would actually benefit the country and yourself as the business, of course, within a prescribed period of time. But then you get the hundreds of thousands of people who have been, you know, regurgitated by the mining sector because of the retrenchments, loss of jobs, injuries, who still have to feed their families, and whatever they get from the government is just not enough to make ends meet. I actually interviewed 150, it was a conglomerate of artisanal miners back when I was in Bloemfontein, um, in Kimberley. They called themselves the Kimberley Zamazamas. Now, they, their only call to authorities, mining authorities and the government is, listen, we don't want your help because we have tried to come to you amicably as the government, as authorities, for you to meet us halfway and to enable us to empower ourselves socioeconomically, and you have failed. So once, so realizing now that you have failed to actually do good on your promises, empower us so we can actually meet you halfway on your promises. 
If you have ever driven past um, Delmas into Whitbank and Bomalanga, you will witness all the heaps of land um, that are actually dug up by all these excavation um, um, uh, trucks and all of that. Those are called mine tailings. So the artisanal miners of Kimberley actually approached the government as well as Petra Diamonds to say, we, don't, we, we acknowledge that we are informal and in your eyes illegal and we don't have the technical capacity to actually mine deep underground minerals. However, you as the large scale mining company, mining mine tailings is actually not economically attractive to you because you are interested in the mining reserves that are actually you know, burying all the huge reserves of diamonds. But them is the artisanal miners, which actually use um, basic tools like shovels and buckets to actually um, go through all the dirt and whatever. They were interested in the mine tailings. They were asking, give us rights and permits to actually go through the mine tailings so we can find diamond dust, little rocks, whatever, so we can actually sell that and feed our, f our families. Excuse me, I'm talking too fast. And feed our families. But then, the, 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 the Department of Mineral Resources at the time was also just like, okay, if you want access to the mine tailings, you still have to apply. Because at the end of the day, it still conforms to the constructs of mining. And it is impossible to expect people who have been so marginalized and infringed socioeconomically and socially to be, to be able to have the capacity to compete on such a stage, even if it is on an artisanal basis. So. Those things, uh, those loopholes about money and all the application procedures are actually embodied in the MPRDA, which is the law that governs mining and minerals in South Africa. So in the preamble, you start by saying, yes, we acknowledge that um, the resources of the country are for everyone's use and for everyone's benefit. However, you again say, you don't even acknowledge that artisanal and small scale miners play an important feature and they, and they um, welcome into the, into the industry can actually fulfill your objectives and your preamble. So it's this huge circle of being locked out of an economy which has already deserted you. Um, and it's, it's, it's difficult. So, so Galila, if I'm hearing you correctly, there's so many things you've just highlighted for us, giving us the example of mining. But there's a few things that you've said, is that this, there's systems that have failed people. That's one. Is as much as we like to take the vision that uh, Desmond Tutu gave to us. And I believe it was a vision, you know? It was casting a vision, but we know with the vision, it doesn't mean this is practically what's happening right now. It's a process, it's a long thing. So there's a lot of practicalities that have been unaddressed. There's social economic factors which continue to go on as they were before that need to be um, reformed and people need justice for what happened and is continuing to happen. So for you, if I ask you straight, do you think the Rainbow Nation is as it should be currently? No. no. And uh, May I risk be, uh, being rude and, ask and interject there before um, Sikilela yes. answers that question, no Elsa? Please. I'd love to hear his answer, um, but I think it's just um, a vital question you ask there. And um, I think Desmond Tutu did very well to coin the term Rainbow Nation and with that this vision of what South Africa could look like. I think we'd all agree that the Rainbow Nation doesn't today exist. But I think it's important that we try and resuscitate the idea of the Rainbow Nation. And I'm tempted to say that it's, it's an idea that is dying. It isn't fully dead. Um, I'm very thankful for that. And I think if it were, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Um, Ilza, you just mentioned practicalities, the failure of systems. And I'm of the, the belief that we need to focus firstly and primarily on the ideas that we possess. And I think my concern, one of my concerns, is that the church in South Africa has come to rely too much on the state. Now, I'm not discounting the role of government, but I am wondering whether following uh, processes and procedures like the TRC, for example, the church and possibly, more specifically, the white church didn't sit back on its laurels and decide we have now dealt with the past. And I think at the outset of today's episode, um, Ilza, you mentioned this perception that the, 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 the past has been dealt with, that we've worked through it. And I think everyone on the, the panel today will agree that this is a misperception. And I think it's important that within the church's walls, I use that term intentionally, every Sunday morning that we, we pick at and dig out 
um, these issues that are preventing us as a nation group, I'm referring there to a spiritual nation, that are preventing these different colors from coming together and forming one rainbow. And I think that's a very powerful image because it speaks to unity. And I think in unity, that is where any people group or spiritual group will find its strength and uh, better be able in the context of diversity to tackle and resolve the, the variety of problems that, that face us as, as a nation, as a South African society. Thank you for raising that, Craig. I think you raised some very valid points there. Maybe just to then direct the next question. Uh, I'm really curious to ask this question because there's something that you mentioned a lot as well. You've mentioned it, and Craig, you've mentioned is this idea of the colors, this metaphor of the rainbow. Now, um, there's a author by the name of Kim Heller, who when she writes in a book, she quotes um, Faith and Tumbi, and she says the notion of the miracle nation, so the rainbow nation, was nothing more than a misguided tranquilizing drug. Okay, that's the one statement on the one side. The other statement I found by someone called Robbie uh, Davis Hannibal says it's a reality in the making. Are these polar opposites? Or are they in fact alluding to the same point? What are your thoughts? And maybe Craig, if we can direct the question to you first and then we can hear from I, you guys. I apologize again for interrupting uh, before Tekka later answered earlier on. Craig. Um, I, would, I would definitely lean towards the, the latter comment made there or statement by that academic author. Um, I think it is a reality in the making and obviously we can have a discussion around to what degree it is a reality today. The claim that it is a tranquilizer, I'm, I'm reminded of Karl Marx who referred to religion as the opium of the masses. And so the Marxist belief is that any ideology or set of ideas of a better future really serves as a smoke screen to cover the interests of the ruling class. Now Marxism, I think um, conveniently placed itself outside of that definition. I think the problem with it is that it doesn't allow for or encourage trust between people. Um, and so I think while we need to develop and possess the healthy recognition that the Rainbow Nation doesn't currently exist in our country, it is something uh, worth working towards. And it isn't necessarily something that must be in the interests of a narrow interest group. I think if properly pursued, it can benefit um, every nation within the borders of our country. If I, if I may also come in there, um, I, 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 it's, for me, it's, it's neither nor on those two statements. Um, because as, as, the, as I'm spending time uh, reading on Desmond Tutu, um, this radical black theologian activist coming from the poor townships of South Africa, rising into the nation and, um, and then becoming this bishop and then the, 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 the chairperson of the TRC. You sort of like read into his story and you realize that people like Desmond Tutu's story is not really justified because people who read in, in their stories, um, they read them in not in a, you know, when you are knitting something together. Because Desmond Tutu doesn't just come post 1994 and you will hear a lot of white people will be quoting Desmond Tutu post 1994. But Desmond Tutu is, this, is the one who said black lives don't matter in the 70s, but we don't take uh, 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 that into uh, 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 our thinking when we, thought we, th we, 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 we talk about Desmond Tutu. So as I was reading and I came across, there's this book in, in, in theology that is very famous right now, written by this American about Desmond Tutu and how, um, you know, all this was just Desmond Tutu was wrong to make a uh, black South African to, uh, to, to forgive and stuff. And you read this book, you realize this person doesn't deal with Desmond Tutu's work. They deal with everything that the, pro the media has propagated. So lots of, it, it's lots of these things. If you read through Desmond Tutu's uh, 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 No Future Without Forgiveness, you'll realize that uh, you read his sermons, uh, 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 you, you hope and suffering. 
all of this thing Desmond Tutu is about justice. But how much that gets politicized and, and you know how the media also plays its role. It's, it's very fascinating. Now coming back to this, uh, 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 it, it, it could have been, you know, um, you can argue that it, he was just dreaming. But if we problematize rainbowism like I, I, I said before, the fact that the new generation, fees must fall, they are not letting this go. You know, they're continuing in their ancestors' footsteps. That is actually, for me, if we want to problematize the being actually for the rainbow. Because you will keep reminding people that because we have one color now, you know, defining South Africa. Whether you go to theological education, you go to everywhere, there's only one lenses, and those are Euro-Western lenses. There's no space for any other person. So therefore, the rainbow in that sense doesn't, you, you understand what I mean? It's, it's one color that is there, and the, this one color defines everything. But if we follow the rainbowism and we, we look at it upside down, not through Western lenses, you'll realize that rainbow actually could be used. So this is why I'm saying it's not either or, you know, these things uh, uh, work together, but it's just also we have to take off the lenses that we've been given to look at things. Because also it's problematic also how we look at the rainbow with these Western lenses that universalize. And, and, and this is the problem about forgiveness, is that it is a Christianized in the TRC and made to uh, look in a certain way. My friend who goes to the Dutch Reformed Church once said to me, no, but in the Dutch tradition, if you say forgive me, you, you've forgiven me, it means that it's done, it's gone. You, you, you understand? Because also being Christian is it, it, it links to identities and culture. Like us as Methodists, we link in a, to a certain identity, which is English, which is also, a, you, you understand. But if you look at forgiveness as ukolelwaniso, ukolelwaniso means something that you are doing to each other. It's not something that is one way. So also, if we can also take off the glasses and, 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 and look at it upside down, we, we will see that these two uh, uh, concepts work together to bring about change. May I just jump in here? I'm just thinking back now. Um, your, your question earlier was, um, is the Rainbow Nation as it, as it should be currently? And my answer you know, is, is, is no. But at the same time, I do want to footnote my statement and say, it was admirable for um, Utes Mundu to, to dream of this era of union and unity and forgiveness and oneness because I also, I can't speak for anyone who has lived prior to 1994 because I wasn't there and I do not have those first-hand experiences. You would get classes of people in different schools of thought where some people would be, you know, I just can't wait to forgive and forget because it has been such a traumatic experience. Whatever aisle you are speaking from or whatever perspective you are um, opining from, there is still the possibility that there are people who are, you know what, I'm okay with this, I'm content as we speak about how my life is living, all of that, and I'm done. But the issue for me with that is it does not account for the lived experiences of everyone else who can't agree with you, who just can't bring themselves into this idea of unity and collectivism and we are all good now, so drop, the, drop all your arms, it's good, you know. It, 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 you have to acknowledge that there are so many experiences that are not accounted for, even in this conversation. So for people now to say, oh guys, come on, just get over it. It is unfair, number one, and number two, it is cruel. It's cruel because they, they are reminded of how they were living every single day because not much has changed. If you look at the unemployment um, rates in South Africa, they're growing, the poverty, the state of our schools. It's no use to build a school if you aren't going to maintain it. So, you know, so, so what I'm actually interested then in, 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 in bringing, and Angela I'm actually interested in bringing then, is to say, could we say 
democracy or rainbow nation outside of our context could be an idea that could be considered. But within our context, the point of departure was problematic. Now, here I would want to bring in Mwele Zimbeki's suggestion that all that ever happened was there was a change in administrators. It's basically the same thing that happened during the Ferienaching Treaty, a change in administrators of the economy. There was no real transformation based on the issue of land and every other thing. Now, having said that then, also say, the issue of transformation then becomes a very difficult conversation when you consider the land debate. Zimbabwe is what many might call a South, or an African, Southern African Via Dolorosa, where the Roman Empire takes Jesus, persecutes him in public, so that everyone can see as an example that you dare, you dare stand up against this empire. This is, what's hap this is what will happen, you know. As many would say, he could have easily been uh, killed with a sword. He could have, there were so many ways of killing Jesus, but there was a system that was in place so that there was, it's an, it becomes a public example. And therefore, one can easily say that the UN sanctions are an extension of the Berlin Conference that continues to survive. And through those sanctions, it also says to Africa, you dare try to achieve real transformation. This is what will happen. Okay, can, okay you want to say I just want to <laughs> sneak in a pointer before I forget. And you know, I love how you frame it because we, we also have to appreciate the fact that the idea of a democracy of a constitutional state in South Africa functions in a global idea of democracy yes. and functions in, in a global idea of equality. Hence we are given the prize as one of the best constitutions. You understand? But then at the same time, it, I mean, it's meaningless. It's water in a hand. It's going to sift right through. If you have an amazing constitution and all these revolutionary um, um, preambles that precede all these um, uh, laws, but then the will of the people or the will of the actual um, authorities is mitigated or neutralized somehow by whatever factors because it's a myriad of factors. It's no use having amazing laws if you aren't going to implement them. Now I'll come in here before Levato uh, speaks again. Um, I, I agree with what CK Lelo is saying about legislation and the constitution and even if we agree that it is the best in the world, I don't think it will help us as a nation to fulfill our potential if we don't recognize human dignity, a dignity that facilitates, I think, respect for one another and, and honoring one another. And so when we talk about a transformation, you know, we can talk about political liberation, um, economic freedom or liberation. I think first and foremost, and if we agree, if we agree on a belief in Jesus Christ as God, we first and foremost have to be transformed before him, in him, and through him. And I think once that has happened, we're on a better space or platform to pursue the practicalities of the world in which we live. Um, I liked what Lerato was saying about being cognizant of the lenses we are wearing when we analyze these things and when we look at the environment around us. And I think the challenge for the church is to ask, Firstly, why are we not discussing the idea of the rainbow nation? And secondly, how do we define it as a unified body? And when I use the word unified, I mean in theory or in biblical terms. Um, and I think that will help the wider country move, I think, a long way or closer towards um, the kind of society that is more just and, uh, and more equitable. So I'm, I'm hearing a lot of references to government, to the state, to the constitution, but I'd just like to maybe challenge all of us to think a bit more about transformation in biblical terms. And uh, first and foremost, transformation of the heart. And I understand and agree that that also touches on the transformation of a material world, because that has to follow on um, from being transformed first spiritually in terms of one's thinking. Craig, maybe here's my thing, you know, before we, we I, I'm aware of time. Here's the thing. Do we sometimes not as Christians romanticize the idea of transformation, biblical transformation? And in the process, we miss the fact that a Jesus who was transformed was so passionate about justice that he was willing to take on the cross. Was so passionate about justice that he was willing to stand up in his own synagogue 
to at, 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 and knowing that he will be rejected and say the spirit of the Lord is upon me he has sent me to set the captives free and so we go on it was so he was he was so transformed that his passion for justice leads him to his disciples basically asking for a mandate and they say look we hear John's disciples pray but how must we pray what is our mandate and in his mandate, he engages social economic issues. Give us our bread, our daily bread. There is a social economic issue when you consider the context. Don't we sometimes romanticize at the expense of justice, the person Jesus? I think the temptation to do that and the practice of doing it certainly does exist. And um, I don't deny that uh, God is a God of both mercy and justice. And so when I refer to transformation, that also includes questions around justice and what that looks like. But I think the key, the key point I'm trying to make is the church has to have a discussion about that um, with the understanding that it's made up of different groups with different historical experiences and different realities in, in the present day. I'm just concerned that there aren't enough of these discussions happening, and that's why I appreciate um, what we're doing today. On, 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 I guess on this issue of mercy and justice, but also just, I, 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 although now I forgot my thoughts, but you said some amazing stuff. And, and, and you also said some, because um, talking about individual forgiveness. And, and um, this is my thesis, by the way, so now I'm afraid to. We are getting a sneak peek. Yes, because, because, uh, if you look at Desmond Tutu's childhood, he didn't have a proper relationship with his father. And he refused to forgive his father until he died. So the conviction of his forgiveness, like we say in black, you don't come to the text just as you, there's no such thing as a scholastic view. You come in a society with a certain experience and context. Desmond Tutu's forgiveness is based on his personal journey. The fact that when his father called him, he didn't come still. And then he died. So this, this kind of individual forgiveness, yes, it's all good now because Desmond Tutu has went through this trauma in his life. You know, because also we understand why it was so hard for him to forgive his father. If you go back and read the story of, 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 of Desmond Tutu. But the thing is that when you take this individual process and you put it in a social context, because the problem about colonialization, apartheid slavery, it did not happen to individuals. It targeted a community. This is why Mahmoud Mamdani argues that the whole TRC got it wrong. Because then we magnify these individual you know, moments of forgiveness or reconciliation, which for me, when I read those stories, they were actually not even moments of reconciliation or forgiveness. It's just that what we want to impose on those stories, all those Google to seven mothers that now define what is Ubuntu, what is forgiveness and reconciliation in the TRC reports, they kept on talking about justice. They kept on talking about what it means to become, to be human again, because the whole thing is, is not about honoring. How are you honored when you have not even lived? These are questions about existence. So if you look at this thing, all the struggle that we've been having in South Africa has been the question of existence, being, of being able to live. And, 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 and I forgive uh, people in a, a, a way like Desmond Tutu because if you look at our history, it's also based on context. So if we don't bring context when you have this conversation, everything gets lost. It makes sense for Desmond Tutu and Nelson Mandela wants to talk about forgiveness. They live through trauma, like guns flying in front of them. For us, we are like James Baldwin in the time of James Baldwin. If you read uh, James Baldwin's book, um, fire next time. When he begins that book telling the story to his 15 year old ne uh, nephew, he says, he talks about those who are in the street taking drugs and those who are in church. And then he says, we all know what is the problem, but no one can say what is the problem. 
but we know the problem is whiteness. You, you, you understand? So for us, we live in those sophisticated times. But for them, they have the trauma. And if you look back in the frontier wars, also the generation just after the frontier wars was so afraid to speak up and ask for justice because of the remembrance of what it means when you stand against the system. The trauma. The trauma. Then, then you, you, you understand? Then people get, then the next generation is like, no, no. That, so we are in a cycle of violence, a vicious one that goes on and on and on. And this is why I'm saying when we read our story, we need to stop saying this is what Desmond Tutu Mandela say. We need to say this is our story and knit it together. That's so powerful. It's just really amazing. So something I want to uh, kind of link between what both of you guys said is at some point you mentioned that people want to say let's get over it, right? But we cannot uh, just ignore people's stories because it's, it's almost, if we say let's get over it, we're speaking from a privileged position actually because our survival, our daily bread does not depend on justice. If we can get ourselves to a place to say, let's just forget about it, let's move on, it means our daily bread does not depend on justice of the past to happen. Now, to link that to what Craig said about the Christian idea, because we don't have much time left, I want to just play around here for a sec. And I, wanna, I just want to present an idea that I was thinking about, about this conversation. I want to see what you guys feel about it. Okay, so this book um, that I've been looking at from Tim Heller, she says this, she says, my moral and political consciousness will not allow me to vote for a political party that is incapable or unwilling to fundamentally transform South Africa. I cannot sanction a political party that places narrow white privilege before the good of the black majority. I will not support a political party that does not place the will and welfare of South Africa's poorest first and foremost. There's lots of issues in there, and we don't have the time to speak into each and every one of them. But what I want to highlight is to bring in this Christian idea of the Christian response. It is easy in the church to say, let's just forgive and forget. But there is an aspect that we cannot move on without justice. The same way that she says she cannot vote for a political party, we cannot be a church that says we just want to move on without placing the um, importance, placing the necessities of the least and the last at the foremost. That's what I want to say. I want to hear your thoughts on it. C can I say something brief? Five uh, minutes. If, uh, please stop me because, I, uh, because <laughs> I'm remembering now the mercy and justice which I didn't sure. touch on. Because for me, the story of Jesus is amazing. And, and I mean, this Old uh, Testament professor at, at UP once said to me, well, you'll be surprised what the people who lived in that time will say about Jesus. He was no uh, uh, Jesus saints. No, no, Jesus was a radical, was a rebel at, 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 at that time because he was living under a Roman Empire. So, but the thing is that if you look at the story of Jesus, you see mercy, you see the need for justice, him putting himself to go through this process. And I always say when I preach as a lay preacher, this you know, God forgive them, the first word he said in the cross. I'm like, he doesn't say, he's not saying that to the empire. He's saying this to his people that have been so oppressed that they don't even know what is right and wrong. That they, I mean, if you look at Ezekiel, the, the audience that is there, that is saying Jesus must be crucified, his own people that there. Look at the book of Ezekiel. When God says to Ezekiel, you are dead. You are, live, you, you, you are the walking dead. You don't exist. This is what he says to Israel because they are under oppression. You know? So he says, you're going to uh, 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 sing to these bones until they awake again. And, and, and for me, when I look at that forgiveness from that context, it's, it's, it's being able to look at these people and you realize that they've been trying to survive because we try, we're not living, we are survivalist. We survive no matter what. So if you look at that story of Ezekiel and, and connect it to, to, to the cross, that is mercy. 
and, 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 and something that we never really get in, in, in South Africa because everything, uh, when black people, even when you are in university or whatever, I'm the last person to get a scholarship, black woman to get a scholarship of the Desmond Tutu, uh, but most of that scholarship didn't go to black people. If you look at that scholarship, most of the people who were on that scholarship uh, were white people. And, and this is a scholarship that belongs to Desmond Tutu, you understand? Then you begin to say, that there's, there's never mercy. There's never a shade under the, 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 the sun that we can hide ourselves. You, yeah. you, you get what I'm saying? Yeah. Sure. Perhaps sure. in the Let's interest of time, break. yeah, perhaps in the interest of time, I would just like to nip this and say, um, mercy, justice, transformation, rainbowism, all of that, in my opinion, will never be achieved because, or perhaps, unless the ugly heads of the remembrance and the trauma and the socioeconomic difference continue to rear the ugly head every single day. When I was driving here, there were three teenagers, I'm sure, right by the Caltex, um, by Lone Hill, dancing on the road with red shirts and black pants. They will dance and then when the traffic lights go green, they you know, ask for you know, anything you can give. And every day we are reminded that so many people are not able to live but are surviving. Those are the very symptoms of the greater ill that South Africa is not accommodating to everyone. And just my last point, very little is even discussed about the psychological and, psych and, and the emotional traumatic residue that remains in people who just have to survive in a world or in a country that claims to be for them. That for me is something that is a dangerous topic, but it must be had. It's imperative, it's imperative. Greg, over to you. Tony, thanks. I think I'll, I'll, I'll try and speak a bit more directly to the, uh, the quote that Ilza read out. I don't believe, and I recognize the, the value of politics. I believe in politics. I believe in political parties. But I also believe that no political party in this country or any other can transform a society in the way that God wants it to be transformed. And so it's the church's responsibility to take that mandate given to us in Matthew 28 upon our shoulders. And the challenge in all of this is the struggle is I think that we fail to see one another as people created in the image of God. And I'm, I'm clearly speaking to the church body now. And I think the degree to which we fail in that regard is the degree to which we will continue seeing the kinds of problems to which both um, Lerato and Sikalela have, have, been, have been talking about um, during this episode. So I think there's an incredible um, amount of work to be done. I think it's difficult to work, but I certainly also believe it's possible to do it successfully um, with the recognition that no society in this world is ever going to be entirely harmonious. As long as we are sinful individuals, we are always going to have divisions and always going to have problems. But I think it's important that we pursue the kind of vision that we receive through Jesus Christ. Thank you so much. Sigilela, Lerato, Craig, I think from Ilsa and I, it's really a big thank you. Um, this is the second of many hot topics conversations to happen on this particular topic. And just as we close, I want to remind you that Jesus comes into the picture, a occupied Judea, and yet he leaves Judea occupied. And that is one of the mysteries that we need to continue to engage. That perhaps what Jesus does is he brings things into light so that people can start engaging reality and the reincarnated body, or rather the continued presence of Jesus through the church has to do the difficult work because you will do greater works than these. And that's it from us. Thank you so much.